Hey guys, Mr. Klein here. So really quick apology before this video kicks off, mainly because of some audio issues I had recording most of the footage last year. So unbeknownst to me while I was recording it, uh, the wireless microphone that I was using was on its way out. Uh, so at times you'll hear some static and in other times like one speaker will go dead because of the fact that the control unit was dying and I didn't realize until I was putting it together. So real quick apology for that. Also, I completely forgot to say, hey guys, Mr. Klein here at the beginning of the video. So I was putting it right here. All right. So there you go. Uh, that's the introduction I need to tell you. And now with the final installment of the Bayou Tesh campaign. So in this, the final episode in the series on the Bayou Tesh campaign, we're going to look at what happened over the final weeks of the Union invasion of Acadiana, as well as how the civilians and enslaved African Americans fared throughout the fighting. So if you've seen the two previous episodes, skip to this time in the video and pick up the story where we left off. So if you want a quick synopsis of the Union campaign because you haven't seen those, here we go. So in the spring of 1863, President Abraham Lincoln ordered Union forces under the command of General Nathaniel P. Banks to invade the Bayou Teche region from Union-occupied New Orleans in southeast Louisiana. So the Bayou Teche region was one of the wealthiest in the entire Confederacy due to its large sugar and cotton plantations. Defending the region was Confederate General Richard Taylor, who did not have a large enough force to successfully defend the area from this invasion. Instead, he attempted to slow down the advance of the choke point outside of the town of Patterson at the Battle of Fort Bislin. And while it was primarily successful, the Union landed the force under the command of Brigadier General General Quiver Grover north of Franklin in an attempt to encircle the Confederates. However, both Union advances were too slow, and Taylor, after leaving Bislin, was able to meet Grover's force outside of Franklin at the Battle of Irish Bend. The battle was short and bloody, but while the Union took the field, Taylor's entire Confederate force escaped encirclement. General Richard and his force may have escaped the Union trap, but he wasn't in the clear just yet. Now, instead of trying to escape encirclement, he had to retreat faster than the Union could advance. Not an easy task considering the geography of Acadiana. So you see, the Bayou Teche region back then was heavily forested or covered with farm crops, with really only one single maintained road between Franklin and Vermilionville, which today is known as Lafayette. This road would soon be filled with refugees fleeing the Union advance, possibly slowing down his escape further. The pace of the retreat was punishing, so as Arthur Hyatt, a member of the 16th Louisiana Infantry, recounted from the escape from Irish Bend, Quote, Thus we had marched about 26 miles in 15 hours and fought a battle in the bargain. But such a terrible hard marching I had never witnessed before. Our feet are all blistered and swollen and we have scarcely had anything to eat. What with hunger, thirst, mud, rain, marching, fighting, dust, etc., etc., we are perfectly worn out. Close quote. To keep the Union force at a distance, Taylor released small units to serve as a rear guard. And what they would do is they would briefly skirmish with bank skirmishers whenever they met before retreating further to the north. So while they were skir skirmishing, this required banks on occasion to actually have to stop and deploy his force in case there were more Confederates there waiting for an ambush. So there was a minor skirmish near Generate on the 15th, which slowed the Union advance down enough to give Taylor time to actually pass through New Iberia. While he was there, he took an unfinished gunboat named Stevens, sailed it a couple miles downstream and sank it in the middle of the Teshish Channel in order to prevent any Union gunboats from sailing further north. Taylor's retreat and the Union advance brought the havoc and terror of the Civil War to an area that had previously been isolated from the carnage. The area at the time was highly rural, with the communities along the Tesh being really no larger than about a thousand people in New Iberia and Franklin, according to the census. In between the towns were large plantations like Bayside behind me, with thousands of enslaved African Americans toiling in the fields for the valuable sugarcane crops that made their owners some of the wealthiest men in the South. The Tesh was also home to the Cajuns, French settlers who arrived in the 1750s after being expelled from Nova Scotia by the British. The Atchafalaya Swamp isolated the region from the rest of Louisiana, meaning that the Cajuns were generally ignored in Louisiana and politics and commerce in the antebellum area, especially since the vast majority of them were poor farmers. General Richard Taylor described the Cajuns as, quote, Isolated up to the time of the war, they spoke no language but their own patois. The few slaves owned were humble members of the household, assisting in the cultivation of small patches of corn, sweet potatoes, and cotton. 
from which the last the women manufactured the wonderful Atacapal cottonade, the ordinary clothing of both sexes, close quote. Those civilians who could escape the Union advance did so, while others waited for them to come with a mixture of fear and trepidation. Foreign flags appeared on some houses owned by immigrants to the United States with a thought that a soldier wouldn't dare harm the property of an alleged or real British or French citizen. When a town was occupied, residents were given the opportunity to swear the controversial oath of allegiance to be considered U.S. citizens again and not members of the rebellion of the Confederacy. Like I said, taking the oath was extremely controversial. There were sometimes consequences for not taking the oath. So according to one source, a plantation owner outside of Franklin begged Union forces to protect his property. After refusing to take the oath, the man soon saw his home and other buildings go up in flames, lit on fire by slaves as well as Union soldiers. For the Union soldiers, the Tesh region was seen really differently. Many letters and accounts from soldiers describe the area as beautiful and full of plenty and a paradise. So this really worked the General Nathaniel Banks' advantage, as his strategy rested on his army living off the land and foraging food. Plantation homes became officers' quarters, barns became kitchens, and infamously, church pews here at the Episcopal Church of the Epiphany in New Iberia became feed troughs for horses and mules, and the church itself actually served as a guardhouse for prisoners and a hospital. Of course, with 18,000 men on the march, they did a little bit more than just gathering whatever food they needed. The 114 New York volunteers described in their history of their unit as, quote, the men soon learned the pernicious habit of slyly leaving their places in the ranks when opposite a planter's house to, quote, appropriate a chicken or, quote, confiscate a pig or, quote, gobble a few turnips and radishes. Frequently in entering the well-furnished rooms of some mansion, they would find a table loaded with the choicest liquor and wines, which the owner in his haste had partly used or left untasted, close quote. The account goes further and describes widespread looting along the way, with men being seen with antique clocks and even a family Bible taken from a plantation home in their possession. However, the thrill of looting would wear off rather quickly, as they soon realized they'd have to carry those war trophies throughout the entire campaign with them. Thus, the road to New Iberia soon looked like any other road after a conquering army marched through. With the shoulders, quote, littered with books, furniture, chinaware, portraits, ladies' apparel, farming utensils, and every portable thing that possibly can be imagined, close quote. Union commanders struggled to keep the men under control. Some estimates and sources say about 500 men were involved in the looting, meaning punishment was necessary to keep the men in line. A private from the 131st New York Infantry Regiment was caught taking clothing from a home. General William Dwight ordered the man shot in front of his fellow soldiers as an example. Now, after that incident, there were no more executions. However, Union soldiers caught looting were court-martialed for their crimes and punished as a result. While the white citizens of the Tesh region fled from the, quote, Union menace, the enslaved African Americans in the region saw the conquering army as the savior they had been praying for. The 114th New York Volunteers described the process as, quote, at every plantation, the road would be lined and fences covered with grinning faces, men, women, and children curtsying and bowing, singing and dancing, all attempting to express their joy at once. Quote, I'm so glad to see you all. Quote, glory to the Lord. He let me see this blessed day. Quote, are you all Yankees? I thought you all had horns. Oh, you just ought to see the old master run when he heard you were coming, close quote. Most of them would have their bundles all ready to leave their homes and fall in with the troops marching along. It required the most strenuous exertions to keep the army from being clogged with thousands of former slaves, close quote. For the enslaved African Americans in St. Mary and St. Martin parishes, Union forces were actually not there to free them. In fact, they couldn't emancipate the enslaved people even if they wanted to, as it was technically illegal. Well, why? Well, the Emancipation Proclamation specifically exempted those parishes, as at the time of its issue, portions of both parishes were under Union control. Therefore, they legally were not in rebellion against the United States. However, Union forces freed African Americans in Lafayette and St. Landry parishes. Regardless, more than 5,000 African Americans fled their plantations here and in St. Landry Parish. They were sent to Brashear City by General Banks, and many later
there formed a nucleus of the 2nd and 3rd Regiments of the Louisiana Native Guard, which were some of the first all African American regiments in the Union Army. For those enslaved African Americans who were unable to leave their plantation, their fortunes were mixed. Many refused to do work for their masters anymore, and if their master had fled, they simply left the plantation to join groups roaming the countryside. General Banks left military police behind in order to keep law and order in the occupied territory, and they worked to convince African Americans to return to their plantations to work for wages under a plan developed by Banks when he first took command in New Orleans in the beginning of 1863. So according to some reports, this seemed to actually work here in modern Iberia Parish for the most part, but in other areas, there was violence, especially in St. Martinville, where former slaves actually gathered into a force and attempted to attack the town, leading Union troops to fire on them and later hanging the leaders of the attack from a bridge across the bayou. Keeping African Americans working on the farms and the plantations was vital for one of the objectives of the Bayou Teche campaign, the large-scale confiscation of goods and crops to placate commercial interest in the North. So whatever his men hadn't looted, General Banks ordered his men to gather it all up, pack it all up, and send it back toward Brashear City. So according to his records, Banks said, quote, I have taken possession of mules, horses, cattle, and the staple products of the country, cotton, sugar, and tobacco. I have given the people to understand that those who take the oath of allegiance will receive compensation for this property according to its value. Also, 20,000 cattle, mules, and horses have been forwarded to Brashear City with 5,000 bales of cotton and many hog heads of sugar, Close quote. Banks created a train of goods heading southeast and hired escaped African Americans to assist in driving the horses and cattle as well as manning some of the wagons. So by the time this entire train reached Brashear City at the end of the campaign, there were nearly 10,000 bales of cotton bound for the textile mills of the north. The value of the goods confiscated was worth, according to some sources, about $84 million in 2020 money. This ruined the local economy and left people through throughout the region hungry and penniless. Previously, former farmer and plantation owner alike. When Union forces arrived in New Iberia on the evening of April 16th, General Banks dispatched nearly 1,000 soldiers from the main body on a special mission. They marched about 12 miles to back here, the salt dome named Avery Island, with the express purpose of destroying the salt mine, which supplied the Confederacy's entire salt supply. So the Union already attacked Avery Island the previous year, but the rebel defenders there repulsed them. So so whenever they arrived here, the mine was actually already abandoned by Confederate forces, so the men decided to destroy the boilers, the mining equipment, 600 barrels of salt, and the old powder magazine. One of the ironies of this destruction was that less than a year later, Union soldiers were back over here rebuilding the mine to resume operations for the Union cause. Upon leaving New Iberia, Taylor's column camped right around here at Camp Pratt, a Confederate base on the shore of Spanish Lake on April the 15th. As he made his way the Vermilionville, his army began to shrink through desertions. Nearly the entire 12th Louisiana Infantry Battalion deserted, and a contingent of Texans actually made a break for the border at the first opportunity. The desertions were due to a combination of two factors. So one, the vast majority of men in Taylor's force were draftees, often forced to enlist at gunpoint. And even if they were initially eager to fight for the Confederacy, the long retreat from Bislin and Franklin as well as no chance of them striking back, left them without a motivation to serve a government that seemed to be headed for defeat at the hands of the Union. Taylor tried to cover this in his memoirs when he said that his men were, quote, full of confidence, but the speed of his retreat showed that at least partially, he knew he would have to get at least to the Red River Valley before his men could properly rest and resupply. General Banks tried to keep the pressure on Taylor's force by sending his force at him as fast as they could march. Historian John D. Winters refers to their troubles as, quote, suffocating clouds of dust stirred up by thousands of marching feet added to the miseries of his men. They resembled an army of gray-brown ghosts with their eyelashes and hair loaded with dust, their faces a mask of grime and sweat and their blue uniforms soon the color of the ground over which they marched. On raw, blistered feet, through the twirls of blinding dust, the soldiers were pushed toward Lafayette, 
close quote. A problem developed where infantrymen, tired of the constant marching, began to commandeer horses, mules, and wagons from homes as they passed by. Soon there were dozens of mounted soldiers creating anger and jealousy throughout the marching column. This actually became such a problem that General Banks had to order the entire force halted and a company of the 114th New York Infantry man a checkpoint where any soldier not authorized to ride on horseback was arrested and their transportation confiscated. General Grover's force tried to stay in contact with Taylor's men, but could really only do so intermittently because of a lack of horse cavalry. Taylor arrived in Vermilionville on the afternoon of the 16th and allowed his men time to rest. On the morning of the 17th, the Union caught sight of the rear guard crossing the Vermilion River. Before they could bring their force to bear, the bridge was in flames and forcing a crossing was impossible. Skirmishing ensued and a battle broke out actually at this spot. General Taylor ordered Texas Cavalry Colonel Tom Green to hold the Union force back for as long as possible to allow the rebel column to retreat further. Union reports estimated about 1,000 infantry and six guns, but the actual number was far smaller, with really only a couple hundred men on these banks right here, mainly sharpshooters and four artillery pieces facing them. Today, the battlefield site includes some houses, a couple of law offices, a hibachi grill, a Hilton, and most importantly, an Outback Steakhouse. Like all the other battles in the campaign, the Confederate forces chose the area of battle extremely well. Unlike the Tesh and other bayous in the Acadiana area that have gentle slopes toward the water, the Vermilion actually has steep banks on either side, even though the bayou itself isn't that deep. In addition, the west bank is actually higher than the east bank right here, meaning that the rebel guns had a better angle of fire. The result was that the Battle of Vermilion Bayou consisted of, again, an extended artillery duel with musket and rifle fire that kept Grover's force back. The Confederate losses reportedly were just one man slightly wounded, but General Grover reported a single man dead and five wounded. By nightfall, Green and his men withdrew and continued continued their role as a rear guard for Taylor's column, now 30 miles away in Opelousas. With news of the bridge destroyed, General Banks ordered the army to rest in Broussard, called Cote Gali at the time. Excuse my French. The next day, the bridge was rebuilt and Union forces entered Vermilionville. Reports from the Union advance said that white flags were hung from every home, indicating that the town surrendered unconditionally, and Banks ordered the arrest of former Louisiana Governor Alexander Mouton. Alexander Mouton presided over Louisiana's secession convention and General Banks really did consider him as a threat to Union control and governance in the newly occupied territory. Governor Mouton was arrested, he was sent to New Orleans, and he was put under house arrest. Apart from brief skirmishes, the Battle of the Vermilion Bayou was actually the last battle between Banks and Taylor's forces during the Bayou Tesh campaign. So the campaign quickly devolved into a chase where General Taylor moved at a breakneck pace in order to get to the Red River Valley and reach the safety of friendly forces there. In Opelousas, the state government had already fled to Shreveport, far away from the Union sieges along the Mississippi River. Now, while here, Colonel Green's men linked up with the main force, and General Taylor placed all of the cavalry under the command of General Alfred Mouton. Mouton's orders were to sweep west into the prairies of southwest Louisiana and harass the Union supply lines that now stretch now almost 100 miles through occupied territory. General Banks' men arrived in Opelousas three days after Taylor left, and just like Vermilionville, the town unconditionally surrendered. And in fact, the building behind me is the old U.S. Post Office. For that, it was actually the site of the Louisiana State Capitol, the old Eagle Hotel. Banks sent General Grover to the east toward Port Berry, where he was to link up with the Union gunboats, Estrella, Calhoun, and Arizona. Yes, the same boats used for the Irish bin landing. On April 21st, as Banks entered Opelousas, the gunboats, along with four companies of infantry from New Hampshire, captured Fort Burton in Butte La Rose in the middle of the Atchafalaya Basin. Much like Fort Bislin, Fort Burton was a simple earthen fortification built on the highest point in the area. As a local native, I'm not quite sure these men from New England ended up really being fans of being posted in the middle of a mosquito, snake, and alligator infested swamp in the late spring and early summer of Louisiana. Once in Opelousas, Banks' army settled down and waited for further orders while detachment marched on to Alexandria, only to find it already in Union hands. Banks waited for General Ulysses S. Grant to send him reinforcements to help him take Port Hudson. Now, on May the 12th, Banks was surprised instead to receive a request from Grant to march north to assist in his operation 
administration taking Vicksburg. So concerns over the status of emancipated African Americans is soldiers efforts to send as many bales of cotton and other goods down to the southeast of New Orleans and the threat of Taylor returning to march on New Orleans. Now all that added up to end up causing Banks to refuse the request and resume his plan to capture Port Hudson. After much debate whether to retrace their steps all the way to New Orleans and then head northward or march through the upper Atchafalaya Basin, on May 15th, Banks detached units to head back toward Franklin in order to secure their rear lines while the remainder of the force marched to the east through Sims Port and over Bayou Sarah on the Mississippi River where they laid siege to Port Hudson. And with that, the first Bayou Teche campaign of 1863 ended. So what was the final result? Well, the Teche campaign was an obvious Union victory because at the end of the day the Confederacy had been driven from the region and banks and the Union controlled both the Teche and the Atchafalaya rivers. But while they did do this, they did fail to destroy General Taylor's force with almost immediate consequences for them. As throughout the month of June, bolstered by reinforcements from Texas, the rebels marched right back through the Teche region, recapturing it for the Confederacy and pushing out the small Union forces that were left behind. So they got the Kenner on the outskirts of New Orleans, which was actually almost completely undefended by the Union. On July 10th, Taylor actually considered marching on the city, but news came of the twin surrenders of Vicksburg and Port Hudson, which would mean tens of thousands of Union soldiers would be descending on him had he captured New Orleans. Taylor wisely withdrew and marched the forces right back up through the Tesh region and back to the safety of Shreveport to plot his next move. Few able-bodied men were left due to being drafted into the Confederacy at this point, meaning that civilians and emancipated African Americans in the area were really just left at the mercy of outlaw groups filled with deserters and common criminals known as Jayhawkers. So as if to add salt to the wound, not six months after marching through the Tesh the first time, the Union Army came back through with an even larger force in the fall. The intent of this operation was to recapture the region and then turn west and head to Texas. However, the second Bayou Tesh campaign wasn't as successful as the first one. And with that, this ends this series on an almost forgotten chapter in the Civil War. So apart from a few road signs, almost nothing physically remains of the Bayou Teche campaign, apart from bits found by treasure hunters in sugarcane fields. However, the scars of the war exist with us today. So like I tell my students, civil wars are really, really messy personal affairs, really like family grudges. And it really takes generations sometimes for the final battles to play themselves out. Socioeconomic issues such as racism, economic inequality, political issues such as the growth and power of the federal government, the presence of Confederate statues, and even things as innocuous as redneck jokes and college football bragging rights all have their roots in the Civil War. As time marches on and society shifts, some thankfully will vanish while others just merely sink below the surface. So it's really important to look back on all these events from all sides because they can really inform us of the causes and help guide us toward solutions. And so with that, there you go. I hope you really enjoyed this series. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the comments below. If you want to see more content like this, go ahead and click on the subscribe button and the bell icon to get more contents like this. And thanks for watching.